You are in the ladies' room with Dr. Donica, the only public ladies' room you can enter any time without ever waiting online. I'm your host, Dr. Donica Moore. We'll be having real conversations with real women about really intimate issues. They may be embarrassing, sad, or funny, but they will always be interesting and informative. You know, like the best conversations you've had in ladies' rooms with your best friends or total strangers and a physician. Please join us. Hi, and welcome to the ladies' room. Today we have a fabulous guest, and I am so delighted that she was able to take time out from all of her travels to talk to us. We're talking, of course, with Andrea Fetchko, who is a travel expert, writer, producer, and the co-host of the new ABC series, Vacation Creation, as part of their Saturday morning lineup, Lytton's Weekend Adventure. Vacation Creation takes audiences on inspirational journeys with families facing hardships who reconnect through unique, life-changing vacations. I think every family who's lucky enough to go on vacation reconnects, <laughs> and that's part of the part of it, point of it. But hosted by Andrea and comedian Tommy Davidson, Vacation Creation provides the opportunity for families with diverse backgrounds and extraordinary stories to travel by ocean and explore the world together. Every family's personal experiences, hopes, and dreams are the basis for creating an unforgettable dream vacation aboard amazing cruise ships and then ashore in some awe-inspiring destinations. Andrea is also the creator, host, and producer of the YouTube channel, How To Travelers, which features 85 or more episodes of Travel Insight. H2, oh, I can't even say H2Ts, How To Travelers Success, combined with Andrea's audience reach of nearly 500,000 followers, uh, has made her a reputable travel expert and social media influencer. She's collaborated with major brands from Verizon to Carnival Cruises and GoPro. In addition, Andrea is a travel correspondent for TV Land's documentary series, 100 Best Places, HLN's Vacation Chasers, NBC's First Look, and Vice. So now you know why I'm so lucky she had time for us. Andrea's quick wit and fun energy has also landed her on MTV, FX, Fuse, Sci-Fi, KCAL, Bleacher Report, CBS Sports, Epics, and many more. But today, she is having her career topper with her new claim to fame as one of the very few guests lucky enough to be interviewed in the ladies' room with Dr. Dunica. So you might be thinking, how did Andrea develop an interest in travel? And of course, we are going to ask her. But it sounds like it started at 14 when she became the first member of her family to travel outside North America when she went to Australia and New Zealand on an ambassador program. She says this, I love this line. She says this taught her the transformative power of a passport. She went from social geek to high school socialite in a mere 18 hour plane ride. Nothing that good has ever happened to me on an 18 hour plane ride. <laughs> anyway, since being bitten by the travel bug, she has kept traveling so far to 30 countries and five continents. And she's also lived in five countries. So we're gonna talk with Andrea about her stories from the road, but we're gonna focus on one of my favorite topics healthy travel, and we're going to get all of Andrea's tips. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for coming. I'm so okay. glad to reintroduce you to your own kitchen. <laughs> I know, right? Isn't it gorgeous? Oh, it's so great. glamorous, this travel lifestyle. <laughs> Where was your most recent trip? Where you oh, I just got back from a cruise to Cosmel and mm. um, Grand Cayman. Oh, and I love those places. Yeah, it was the, the final season, or final episode of season two of Vacation Creation, so that was That's exciting. Awesome. So when can people watch Vacation Creation? Um, they can watch it syndicated, so it kind of depends on where you're at, but um, okay. it's usually Saturday mornings mm -hmm. um, around 10 or 11 on ABC. Great. So mm -hmm. what did you do when you were in Cozumel? Um, stingrays. <laughs> stingray City. That. So I really did funny. that. I definitely Amazing. Did that. So I love animals, uh -huh. uh, even though I'm deathly allergic to dogs and cats. And, okay. And, well, everything. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, right. So, so sometimes we have shooting, especially this season where um, Tommy and I don't go on the trip with the family. We kind of like give them their own time. And so I actually did Stingray City on my own dime on my day off. Okay. And I like, you know, I'm doing GoPros. I have my own YouTube channel. So mm -hmm. when I'm not hosting, I'm behind the camera. And they liked my GoPro footage so much that we actually shot it for the show, which I thought was like a win for me. I've had a few of those this season where I was like, you know, when we go to Gibraltar, there are these monkeys that I haven't seen yet. <laughs> really, really cool to go. That so is exciting. awesome. That is awesome. Actually, so did you drink the water in Cozumel? 
Um, yeah. I mean, you don't have ice. You have the yeah. bottled water. Bottled water. <laughs> so, of course, what I'm referring to is Montezuma's Revenge, or, you know, in Mexico, there's issues for people who are not used to drinking the tap water, of course, eating fruit that's been washed, having yeah. ice in your drink. Well, I have a funny story about that because I went to Cancun for, I think my senior year, mm -hmm. spring break with my family and we went to Chichen Itza. Oh, uh, I which, love Chichen Itza. Yeah, not us. No. <laughs> it, was it was so hot. My mom is one of those weird people. She actually doesn't sweat. She just oh. overheats. Okay. It's really bad. So, so we were like dying and then we went to this, you know, on this big tour, we went on a lunch. And I didn't really eat anything mm -hmm. and because I had a little bit of Montezuma's revenge. Uh -huh. And so I went to the bathroom and my, my, my mom was like, oh, yeah, 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 she's sick. And this person on the tour was like, oh, yeah, I've heard about that anorexia. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I mean, I guess it's a compliment. But, okay, so know, tell, tell our viewers what symptoms you get when you have Montezuma's revenge. Well, Montezuma's revenge is basically a colonic, but it's nature's mm -hmm. colonic. <laughs> And since we're in the ladies' room, these are the kinds of things we talk about. <laughs> right, so Just right, a yeah. terrible, terrible diarrhea. And what a lot of American travelers do is go prepared when they go to Mexico with a carton full of Pepto-Bismol, uh, which mm -hmm. is a great preventive um, medicine, uh, but also antibiotics if their doctor will prescribe it in advance for just in case. So, yeah. I hope you enjoyed that trip. Otherwise, uh, my favorite thing to do in that part of Mexico is, have you been to Shellha? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, that's where no, they, uh, the, uh, the river that's half ocean water and half lake water and you swim down the river with, you know, tubes or flippers yeah. you can see all I, the sea creatures. So on vaca my HLN show, Vacation Chasers, I actually mm -hmm. sent someone to there. Oh, okay. Well, you should yeah. on because that's awesome. I that's know. My Add it to the list. <laughs> put, it, put it on the list and bring your GoPro. And if you need a tour guide, I am happy to go again. Perfect. Done. Let's it go. was awesome. Actually, I went there on a cruise um, with a uh, cruise ship executive who will remain nameless. And uh, we were going to check out the, uh, you know, they were going to check this out as part of a potential cruise excursion. And long story short, we got back to the cruise port a little bit too late to make the last ferry in time to get us to the cruise on time. Oh. So how cool is this? He picked up his ship to shore phone and you know, right. called the captain and said, could you hold the ship for us for like an hour? <laughs> oh, that's cool. Because I mean, like, that was very cool. We're shooting vacation creation, but we don't get that kind of pull. Like we're, <laughs> we're told very much. You know, film crew, this isn't Hollywood. <laughs> you are not special at all. So it's yeah. so funny filming on cruise ships because we're actually always the ones opening up doors. Right. <laughs> which has really worked out because I met my boyfriend on the show. Oh, so wow. He, he's such a gentleman. He always opened up doors for me because <laughs> he's been trained by the cruise ship. I always the first. <laughs> well, he should always be a gentleman. So was that planned by the producers or that just was accidental how you met? That was accidental, yeah. So tell us, everybody dumb. wants to know, how did you meet? Well, we and met, he was, he's working behind the scenes and I'm working in front of the camera. And it's actually very much frowned upon uh -huh. to, um, to be working on that type of stuff. But luckily people were cool with it, so. <laughs> Fraternization. <laughs> yeah, usually someone gets fired when you do that, so. Well, um, you're not in the military. <laughs> I know, but they, they, it's just, I think it's this whole thing like, well, if something goes wrong, one of you has to go. Yeah. So they generally just don't want it happening. Right. But um, luckily they were really cool about idea. it. <laughs> That's good. Well, I wish you every happiness and fun adventures together. Thank you. Um, so one of my favorite cruise experiences is that for about 10 years, I got to be a speaker on a cruise ship. Uh, one of my favorite yeah. organizations is called the National Professionals Network. Uh, and they're a multicultural, multi-professional organization that has their annual meeting on a cruise ship. How cool is that? Um, and usually organizations want a different speaker each time, but the way they operate, if they like you, they just keep having you back. So uh, I did get to speak to them about different women's health issues for about 10 years in a row. And that was really my cruise education. And we went everywhere from Alaska to the Mediterranean, uh, lots of times to the Caribbean, um, and it was really just a wonderful experience. So tell me, I understand you come from a family of doctors. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm the black sheep. I went into <laughs> entertainment. 
And I bet they're all jealous. No, no, they're like really cool with their very steady paycheck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I came from, I come from a family of doctors. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my dad works in Detroit ER. My sister works at ICU in Chicago. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so it's intense. So I was telling you before, I, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to travel, I know all the different ways to die. You know, the way that they, they contribute to the conversation. It's like, oh, well, we had a patient that got this. And then they mm -hmm. ended up dying. Like, right. So right. what we want to focus on are all the ways that can prevent you from dying, uh, exactly. all the ways that can keep you healthy when you travel. Yes. Um, and so, sort of like your best travel tips. And I'll throw in mine. Well, how about you do yours, I'll do mine, and we'll go back and forth. Um, what do you think was the best travel health tip that you ever got other than don't die from your, doctor, <laughs> from your medical uh, relatives? <laughs> I actually did a video on how on all the different ways to avoid getting sick on an airplane, but I'm not talking motion sickness. I'm talking, you know, getting the flu or cold or whatever, because I was one of those that was always getting sick. Mm -hmm. And the main issue is really the humidity. Mm -hmm. uh, so because it's filtered air, it's not necessarily that people are, are coughing around you and it's a closed quarter. It's that the air is so filtered that there's actually not enough humidity in there. So that mm -hmm. allows your body to be unable to fight off the infection. Mm -hmm. So you really need to drink like a ton of water. I always bring something like this, mm -hmm. little cucumbers in it, and then it get the so how do they let you bring? Time. How do they let you bring that through security? Oh well, you don't fill it up. <laughs> it's empty. Okay, so my experience so far, at least with the uh, TSA people in Newark, New Jersey, is uh -huh. they're not letting us bring empty water bottles either. I have to put that in my um, in my checked luggage. Um, so I always have to buy a water bottle when I get to the other side, which is kind of frustrating. Although now that I have pre-check, I have some. Leaks. Yeah, I, I've had pre-check for a while and I just got on a flight in Tampa. <laughs> so I was able to bring this, no problem. Um, but yeah, I would say just, you know, really making sure that you are lots of moisture with the, not only with water, but then also putting Neosporin in your nose. Okay. And you mean just around the outside or the edge? No, like putting it in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't like, heard go, that tip. Doing a little, doing, going, going like four years old and getting right in there, seeing what's <laughs> all in there. And so that your nose is actually a big way for you to not breathe in all those different things. And then just making, having a very conscious effort not to touch anything. Don't touch your mouth. Right. Don't touch your um, eyes. Don't touch the food. And if you follow those rules, you won't get sick. Well, probably the most infected thing, speaking of touching things on an airplane, is the inside handle to the uh, washroom. So, you know, another good tip is to use your towel to open mm -hmm. the washroom, or I usually use my elbow or my hip. You don't do that hip check thing to open okay. the door. Uh, but sometimes they pull in. Um, of course, the most important thing to prevent getting the flu in every other year except this year is the flu, flu vaccine. This year, the flu vaccine has not been that effective. Um, and of course, for travels, uh, for travels to places in the, the Southern Hemisphere, you have to remember their flu season is our summer. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to be aware of that. Um, and then, you know, just hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. And a lot of people bring Purell in their carry-on, so long as it's smaller than three ounces. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also, you know, a great, Thing to have with you for when you can't wash your hands conveniently. Yeah, absolutely. So I say water emergency. I also have always with me wellness formulas or counterattacks or something like that. I think that they really, really do help. So whenever I'm trying to feel sick, I just like down counterattack or wellness formula. And it really helps because, you know, I'm on camera, so I can't get sick. And even if I'm sick, they're not going to shut down the production until I get better. You just kind of have to you have to roll. Yeah, you have to pull up Brady and you just gotta have to throw through it. So I'm like, throw care. Extra makeup. Yeah, whatever I can do, and you just have to get your voice out there. So it's like throw care and all those wellness formulas. And I really like, there's a few episodes where you can kind of hear that I'm sick, but for the most part, you know, we kind of keep healthy, which is good. So do you get motion sickness? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, get, I get terrible I, motion sickness on airplanes. Terrible. Well, the, that's the most ironic thing is I don't get it on airplanes, but I get it on cruise ships and oh. Asian creation is all on cruises. So I use the C band. Uh huh. And does that work for you? Game changer, mm -hmm. complete game changer, because I'm one of those few people, I don't know if people know this, mm -hmm. but a side effect 
to uh, motion sickness medication is motion sickness. <laughs> and that's the side effect that I get, which is really fun if you might be doing it recreationally, but if you actually want to not be motion sick, um, it doesn't work. But the C bands, I mean, those things work. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's drug I actually used really them uh, when I was pregnant. I used them mm -hmm. uh, to prevent morning sickness uh, yep. also when I traveled. Uh, and then interestingly, for some reason, when I was no longer pregnant, then I stopped using them. So for me, the only thing that works on a really turbulent cruise is taking medication. And I'll take a scopolamine patch or bonine tablets. Uh, the side effect for me of those medications, and I think the most common side effect, is that it puts you to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, which when you're feeling sick like that, you know, sometimes you really want to go to sleep. Um, oh, yeah. you know, a real difference in cruises, obviously, depending on what ocean you're in, the Atlantic Ocean, especially if you're not cruising from Miami, if you're cruising from further north, that's not always fun. Um, and then different ships, of course, have better stabilizers. Some have better stabilizers than others. Um, so I have been on some ships where it was pretty rocky. Um, and that was yeah. no fun. And then, of course, alcohol is not a great thing. When you're, I mean, or it is a great thing because then just everything goes <laughs> You're like, well, what? 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 <laughs> but I've been on planes where it was just so turbulent that I was literally just holding on uh, for dear life. I actually once had a pilot uh, get on the air after we, we flew through the edge of a tornado over Dallas. And uh, when it was all over and all better, he got on the microphone and he said, how are you all doing back there? I wet my pants up here in the cockpit. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> great, can we land now? <laughs> but no, then everybody laughed and, you know, it was kind of fun. It was good. Uh, so tell us some of your other, what are, what healthy things are you bringing in your carry-on aside from these, you know, cold wellness preparations? Well, definitely emergency, 100%. Mm -hmm. And then I have the wellness formula always or counterattack or something along those lines. The Purell, although I don't really use the Purell as much. Um, it's really like the basics of just keeping hydrated all the time mm -hmm. and just really trying to make sure that I'm not, you know, eating anything on the plane or just really wash my hands and just being very careful about what I touch, mm -hmm. you know, my eyes, anything. And I, I just, I, I used to get sick all the time mm -hmm. and now I don't. Knock so. something quickly, knock something. Um, I'm a scientist, but I'm also superstitious. Okay. Um, I actually bring a travel medicine kit with me mm -hmm. in my carry-on. And I made one for each of my young adult children who are now both traveling quite a bit for business. Um, and basically, it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, I recently added baby aspirin uh, because now I, I am of a certain age uh, where, of course, if you're having any heart attack symptoms, the number one thing to do is take a baby aspirin immediately. But I didn't do it for me because fortunately, again, knocking wood, um, I don't have any significant cardiac risk factors other than my age. Uh, but I was on an airplane and I am one of the few doctors who still does take care of people in an emergency and respond to those kind of things. Um, and there was a woman who actually was the same age as me who was starting to have the beginning signs of chest pain. I didn't, and she also had an upset stomach and she also had abdominal pain. So you may have heard that heart attacks in women can present as abdominal pain or a sense of indigestion. No, and but the, I'm a hypochondriac, so now I'm just oh, no. going to go to the doctor about well, You're way too young to even worry about this. Oh, I've already had like 15 heart attacks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even joking, just ask my parents. <laughs> uh, this woman was uh, 56 years old. Um, and she really didn't look good. And, um, you know, I asked the captain how far we were from, you know, a place where we could safely land and she could be brought to a hospital and it was 20 minutes. So, you know, in that situation, you don't have any diagnostic equipment up in the air. They had a blood pressure cuff. It didn't work. Um, and so I just asked around me, I said, who has a baby aspirin? And it was great. Like five people volunteered. Um, so I gave her a baby aspirin just in case and Tums um, in case it really just was an upset stomach. <laughs> um, so now I carry baby aspirin in my pocketbook uh, just in case anybody else needs it. But I also carry Tums, uh, Pepto-Bismol tablets, chewing gum, which is great if you're starting to feel the early effects of motion sickness. Um, yeah, of course, turning on the air directly on your face, putting a cold rag on the back of your neck can also help. Um, I carry... Is uh, the chewing gum, because I've heard that 
the issue with motion sickness and why it affects everyone differently is it's actually based off of your ear. Absolutely. The equilibrium of your ear. That's why some people, some rocking motions put them to sleep. You might have issues on an airplane. I actually like that turbulence. But the swaying <laughs> of a ship really bothers me. But so I'm assuming that because you're chewing gum, it's, it's, Absolutely. it's also a way to um, reset your eardrums, right? Absolutely. And here's actually a tip for parents who are tra traveling with young babies who, you know, the babies all start screaming when we take off and when we land. Because that's what we're doing on the inside too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're just expressing themselves. Uh, yeah. So covering their ears instead of covering your ears can huh. actually help them equilibrate, but also waiting to nurse them or waiting to give them a bottle uh, till you're going up and, to, and landing can also be a very effective way for them to kind of equalize the pressure in their ears. Hmm. Um, now, many times I've gone up to parents and said, can I just hold your baby <laughs> and walk them up and down, which during the flight is a great way to calm babies. But we've all been in that experience where we've had like a screaming baby. Uh, my son just came up with this great one-liner about a baby uh, on our re recent uh, family trip to Hawaii. He said, that's a category five baby. <laughs> it, flattens oh, yeah. every, it flattens everything in its path. <laughs> Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, that's really true. Um, you know, when the kids were babies, I would always bring tons of snacks and, you know, little toys for them to play with. But the other thing I, f I found, you know, speaking of the ears, is I did get the, Bo uh, the Bose noise canceling headphones several years ago. I haven't upgraded mm -hmm. to the new ones because the old ones cover my whole ear and really right. mention it. And I think that really does, you know, make me feel better. Plus, I don't hear as much of the airplane noise. Well, yeah, I mean, that's also a part of it um, is that there's actual noise pollution. So there's many reasons why you get so tired from traveling, specifically airplane traveling, but also in cars and on trains is due to the noise pollution. So it's really important to have your earbuds in for many, many reasons. But one of them is just so that you can recover faster. But not if you're driving. No, right, exactly. <laughs> um, so we know now that you've had traveler's diarrhea and anorexia. Yeah, of course. And coughs and colds on your on your trips. What was the worst medical problem you ever had on one of your many many trips? Hmm. I mean, I would just say that. Um, well, I, I mean, I did think I was going to die one time. I, I always think that I have a heart attack. <laughs> but in all seriousness, did you really think you were going to die? Yeah, I, I always think that. I'm, I just I always think that I'm going to have a heart attack. So there was, there was one time I was uh, traveling and. In, in, doing a little walkabout of Asia and Australia right after I graduated because I thought, oh my God, my life is over. <laughs> um, and I woke up and I was sleeping on the wrong side, but my whole left side of my body like was numb. Mm -hmm. Or it was maybe my right side. One side, it was, it was numb for a very long time. Um, I only got like five hours of sleep. And then after I started drinking champagne, all the feeling came back. Um, <laughs> okay, usually it's the other way around. <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of weird. Yeah, I probably shouldn't be drinking that much. And then um, I had another one where I actually, I have, I have a, a really bad problem of just having a big purse all the time. And I had my MacBook Pro. I'm now switched to an Air because the bag was so heavy that it actually kind of ripped my chest muscle, mm -hmm. oh, which was, felt like a chest pain. And then also- Wow, it actually heavy. ripped the muscle? Yeah, it kind of like put a little bit of a tear. Wow. And then it, became, it kind of like cut off where, and so I started losing feeling in my left arm. So I was like full on, I'm having a heart attack. Mm. And so, but again, I'm, I'm a hypochondriac because I grew up with my family conversations being about what patients died and how. Mm. <laughs> At the dinner table. <laughs> like normal conversations. So right. I'm always like, oh, that's a heart attack. Oh, that's a great way to die. My, my children can sympathize with you on that. I actually, many years ago, I, I remember this so clearly, I was in the airport in Atlanta and it's a humongous, humongous airport. And I must have landed in one, at one gate and my connecting flight must have been the furthest possible gate on the other side of the airport. And halfway through, I decided I cannot physically carry my carry-on bag any longer. And I popped into one of those luggage stores in the airport and bought my first uh, roller carry-on bag Yay! And, and to this day i use the roller bag every time i travel because it's just not oh, 
It's just not. And for me, my big issue is, is back pain, especially when I travel. Anybody who has back problems on an airplane. Um, I finally found the perfect size uh, lumbar cushion for my oh. back, which is a lifesaver on airplanes. Um, and of course, I lost it after my first trip. I forgot to get it off. Um, and so then one of my friends said to me, why don't you just buy a dozen of them? And, oh, I, did, and I did. And they weren't very expensive, and they, but they're just the perfect size. So now I have a dozen of them and they go with me everywhere uh, when I travel. And that's a lifesaver. Of course, also, I now only travel in sneakers. And now I just don't care what I look like when I travel. <laughs> You Something do get to a point where you're like, uh, yeah. no one's photographing me. <laughs> <laughs> or if they are, it should just be from the waist up anyway. So they yeah. should not be getting my sneakers in the shot. Although for a long time, I made an extra effort to get black sneakers so they would at least match with my back black pants. Mm -hmm. And now I just bring whatever sneakers that I'm going to bring. So of yeah. course, another really important issue for a lot of people, and I can't tell you how many times I've responded to an emergency situation on an airplane where somebody is having chest pain and I'll say, you know, to their family member or to them, you know, do you take medicine for this? Has your doctor prescribed medicine? And they'll say, oh yes, you know, he's supposed to take a nitroglycerin under his tongue. And I'll say like, great, why don't you take one right now would be a good time. And they'll say it's in his checked luggage. So of course the important thing is if you have any prescription medication, mm -hmm. whether or not you think you're gonna need it on the plane, don't put it in your checked luggage. Oh yeah, yeah. Or like somebody I knew uh, did, don't put your laptop in your checked luggage either. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I hope that people are a little bit more wise than that. I mean, you should it's never, amazing. people go through it and they take things. It's just like the mail, you're not gonna. Oh, in in that case, anything. nobody took the laptop. It just got smashed to smithereens. Um, but you wouldn't put anything, you shouldn't put anything extremely, the point is you shouldn't put anything extremely valuable in your checked luggage. And of course, your prescription medicine is extremely valuable if you need yeah. it. I mean, for anything with medicine, you, you probably want to want it, especially on an airplane or something, because automatically everything gets heightened. Right. Um, your body's feeling weird. I mean, I get altitude sickness, so I get altitude sickness whenever I fly. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I think like a basic thing is that you never, you always, you, like, that's kind of one of the things when you travel a lot, you really learn how to pack correctly and also less is more. Yep, and absolutely. So, so give yes. us your top three packing tips. My my number one packing tip is try to have everything in the carry-on. And the way to do that is shoes. Mm -hmm. Just figure out, design all your outfits around your shoes. Mm -hmm. And so have one day pair, one um, night pair, and then your workout, if you are going to work out, wear those on the plane. Use your plane outfit as part of your packing. Right. And then um, for hair, also those hair accessories are really big and bulky. Mm -hmm. Be really honest with yourself about what you're going to be using. <laughs> be really honest. And then, um, and then yeah, it's just a matter of coordinating outfits and really being aware of the temperature mm -hmm. and the biggest and bulkiest things that you're going to have. Wear those mm -hmm. so that you don't have to pack them. Right. That was two. One more. Oh well. The, <laughs> Okay, well, I love together. There's the shoes, there's the um, oh, the hair and the bulky things, and then um, wearing your biggest and bulkiest things, like any jacket or anything that you're going to use. Yeah. Make sure that's something that you can also wear on the on the trip destination. Right. Um, I actually had to wear my winter jacket on the plane when I went to Hawaii, thinking I wouldn't use it at all, and unfortunately, it was very cold, and I had to wear my winter jacket in Hawaii. So yeah, we were just in Cosmo and it was freezing. I was wearing winter jacket as well. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, when you're in Hawaii and you come home and you tell people these sad stories, you get no sympathy. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you, you so really you told, do have to look at the weather very closely. So you told us about this injury that you got because of your big heavy bag. So have <laughs> you switched to a roller carry-on? Are you still carrying a big heavy bag? Well, I still have a really big bag that I love. It's Low and Sons bag, absolutely amazing. But I always have a carry-on roller that I go with mm -hmm. because that's the only way I'm able to carry it, especially for long distances. These airports are huge. If you have layovers, it's really important to do that. Well, the nice thing too, if you're bringing your carry-on roller bag, then you can hook your pocketbook or your you know other bag over the handle. 
Yeah, I don't. I generally don't do that because it's I just always, so hard to pick it up afterwards. And uh, it's, so heavy. it's like it's a really big disaster. So. I always, always do that. Um, so tell us some other travel experiences that you've you've had as far as health. You lived in five countries, so you must have some experience with the healthcare systems in other countries. Ah, uh, fortunately, not really. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. One of the things I've been talking to people a lot about is uh, when you go on a long trip to another country, and especially if your child is doing study abroad in another country, check your health insurance. Because most people now, their health insurance does not cover them if they're in another country. And mm -hmm. most people don't know that. I actually learned that lesson the hard way. Fortunately, it wasn't a very expensive uh, hospital visit. Um, but so when my daughter did study abroad, uh, when my son studied abroad, I got them separate insurance policies that are designed for travelers. And mm -hmm. even if you're going to only be in another country for five days, you really need to be covered because God forbid you fall and break your ankle or, mm -hmm. you know, God forbid, you know, you think you're having a heart attack and you need to go to the emergency room and get the million dollar workup. Of course, people with allergies also need to carry all of their allergy medications, particularly if they've got an EpiPen. Um, you know, that can be, you know, very, very serious. Yeah, but the, the EpiPen only works for 15 minutes. So people have to understand that. <laughs> you need to get to a hospital. It's not like, oh, EpiPen, I'm good. It's right. Like, well, you've got 15 minutes now to find a hospital. Right. But I, think, I mean, yeah, I think it's just one of those things where you have to be, you know, pretty careful and just aware of your surroundings and you just don't be stupid. And I think that's one of the things where people... When they travel, they're like, oh, like, it's so cool. I'm not home anymore. And, and they get a little bit crazy or they let their guard down. Um, you know, maybe like a YOLO mentality. It's just like, ah, oh, no, actually, this is the time to be a little bit more aware of what's going on. Um, I always say just, you know, a big travel tip for women is to be really, really, really aware of your drink. Right. You know, I've, I've had, I've caught many people trying to slip something into my drink. And what I do is I, whenever I have a drink, I always, I always order it. I watch the bartender like a hawk because usually sometimes it's the bartender that's doing it mm -hmm. and then just holding it like this and having a little place for my straw and I felt powder on my hand before wow. so it's really really important and always just you know especially as a girl you're kind of used to guys buying me drinks mm -hmm. there's always being someone that doesn't feel like you're indebted to someone mm -hmm. or feel like that's the only way that you can buy a drink if, if you need someone some random guy to buy you a drink um, probably pass. It's just not, it's just not safe. And, and also I think every person has a spidey sense. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we kind of doubt that, but usually if someone, if something's creepy, go with your gut and you know, better safe than sorry. And I think that's, that's just kind of like common sense stuff. Is and that's really, not just really for girls. I had of yeah. course given my daughter and other young girls this lecture over and over and over again over the years. And it never, ever occurred to me to give my son this lecture. And he was actually on a study abroad trip uh, with some, his singing group in college in Japan at a bar. And they were all together. And uh, I get a call from the police station saying they found him you know, face down in the street. Uh, and apparently he, somebody had put something in his drink for the intention of robbing him, which apparently... <laughs> was very well known MO to the police. You know, they seemed to be, you know, very familiar with this and they said, oh yeah, this kind of happens all the time. Um, and I think another thing that, um, you know, speaking of Japan, that his group of friends was not prepared for is that the alcohol content in beer there was much higher than the alcohol content in beer here that they're used to. So you oh. physically cannot drink as many beers as uh, you would at home there and have the same results, especially if somebody puts something in your drink. So, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's gonna This is a me. male and female thing, obviously for different reasons sometimes. Um, but well, yeah, I, I want to say that's actually funny because in Asia, it's one of the places that I like to travel the most <clears> because <throat> they actually treat, not their women, but foreign women a mm -hmm. little bit better. Um, okay. And so I remember being in Thailand at the full moon party, which is just notorious for bad stuff happening. You're going to go, you're not going to come back. You're not going to leave with all the stuff that you went there with. It's mm -hmm. just notorious for it. It's all inside jobs. And it was so funny because they were talking to me about the harassment. Mm -hmm. No one ever came and talked to me, but then I started 
going like a meter or two away from them and seeing all the people trying to get them to buy drugs, which are super mm -hmm. illegal there. And then it was funny because when we were in the hotel, we stayed at the nicest hotel that was on that island, all the men got robbed. Like their passports taken out of the locks. So it's obviously wow. an inside job. Mine was not touched. They knew I was traveling and alone. So you had left your passport uh, with the hotel? I had oh, kept my passport you? on me because I was a little bit nervous about it. I don't really like to trust those boxes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but uh, they left it in the, and put it in the locked box. So it was obviously an inside job for someone that could get into the, the locked box. Yeah, when I was younger, I used to feel that it wasn't a good idea to have my passport on me at all times because I could be pickpocketed or I could be robbed. Well, yeah, that's, but, I mean, it's very true. But now I travel, when I travel, I always have it on me because I feel like I may need to leave or I may- and You should always have a copy of it as well. Absolutely. So, that so is a have, very good tip. Like, if you don't have your copy of it, like you don't have your passport on you, have a copy of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, I've had issues before in the past with like, you know, my people people program that I did when I was 14, someone came in and robbed the whole bus. Uh, and you know, we're like a big tour group. Yeah. Luckily they had everything there, but I mean, it, this, it, we, every single season of vacation creation, you know, we're traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. The number one pit, way people lose their passports is in the seat pocket on the airplane. Every season, if not two or three times a season, someone on the crew loses their passport that way. Wow. That would mm -hmm. never occur to me to even put my yeah. passport in a Never place. put anything in that seat pocket. It's a black hole. Don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, so tell us uh, some other stories about traveling with the crew and, you know, any medical stories that jump to mind. Um, I mean, it's really fun to be traveling with a crew because especially with TV, you are, everything's kind of produced for you. So mm -hmm. it's really, really the best way. It's one of the things that people love when they come on the show. They're like, oh, wow, someone else is figuring out all the travel plans. All I have to do is just show up. And That's like, so great. Showing up is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> but it is kind of interesting in terms of you are in this heightened world. I would say, you know, the, the kind of the big things that, especially a lot of the crew that had been traveling a lot, they weren't aware of the, you know, speaking of your podcast, the toilet stop. Yeah. So this is where we want to go. <laughs> yeah. Always, always bring change with you. Okay. Because most countries we're used to in the U.S. where restrooms are free. Mm -hmm. in most countries are not. Right. So it's just like 25 cents or 50 cents. We should always have money on you. Right. Because you have to have the right coins. I found yeah. that in uh, Scotland mm -hmm. you know, and it was very inexpensive, but I didn't have the right coins at all times. Exactly. Especially because we're so used to doing credit cards. It's like right. cash. So always just have some sort of coin on you. And then also um, be very aware of the country and their plumbing system. <laughs> so I, I go by general rule. If you see a trash can with lots of stuff in it, use, um, it. <laughs> use it. Do not flush your all your toilet paper because a lot of places they can't handle toilet even toilet paper so well even here you shouldn't be flushing tampons um well, i actually just I saw like, a great sign I mean, who flushes tampons uh, you would not believe how many women flush tampons in fact i was just in a, in a lady's room where i saw a sign i actually posted this on instagram it said um flushing tampons is punishable by death <laughs> I thought that was a great sign. But one of the similar, one of the tips I always say as far as traveling, and again, even if you're traveling in the United States or anywhere, you should always have a package of tissues in your pocketbook. Mm -hmm. Because I cannot tell you how many times I've gone to a public restroom where there's no toilet paper. And yeah. you know, that's very frustrating. For us well, yeah, I mean, always have that or you just always check. I mean, I've been in those situations so many times, but now I just always, I'm always talking like, where is it? Where is it? Um, but I was in countries where, like in Turkey, I remember, I don't think ever when I was in a public restroom, there was toilet paper. Yeah, so that was really Yeah, there are certain helpful. places like that. Um, you know, I, I kind of ran into that in China, but I've, and, and I was just recently went to Cuba, and I I've generally, I don't know, I haven't really run into any issues with, they're not being toilet paper in terms of it's just not available. Mm -hmm. I've had it where I was just unlucky. <laughs> right. It could be unlucky. I could be very unlucky. I yeah. have to give a shout out to Canada, which has 
the nicest public ladies rooms oh, I've yeah. ever seen. First of all, they're immaculate. Second of all, they are readily available. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to really search and search and search for a public restroom, which, you know, many times in the United States will be out and about, and it's very difficult to find a public restroom, which is very difficult for people who have toilet problems. So bladder problems or bowel problems, uh, or if- I mean, at that point though, you just go into a, a McDonald's or a Starbucks, you know? If you're in a place that has a McDonald's or a Starbucks. Um, yeah. You could be in a national park, and well, then you just go in the bush and you hope a rattlesnake is there. <laughs> I mean, be one with nature. <laughs> right, right. Easier, yeah. for, easier for some That's people what than others. It's all about. It's like be one with nature. Remember when we used to do our battles in the bush? Yeah, I'm so <laughs> glad I don't live in that time period. Right. I'm so glad. Um, but yeah, you know, when we talk about in the ladies' room, obviously we're talking mm -hmm. about it because we want to have conversations the way we have conversations with other women in the ladies' room. But we're also talking about all of those embarrassing things, like mm -hmm. you know, what happens when you go to a restroom and there's no toilet paper or there's no tampons or sanitary products. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw a big uh, story in the media that it, Bhopal, India, just you know, announced that their train station now has. Uh, sanitary product dispensers in the ladies room and like this is big news there um, I remember many times when I was in need of such products and even though we might have those dispensers they're usually empty so we're, we're kind of at the good graces of our fellow female travelers um, yeah you know I, I always feel it's kind of like with people who smoke cigarettes they have no problem asking a total stranger if they could bum a cigarette Mm -hmm. No problem. When, when you're a lady in need, <laughs> we're all the same track. We're all sisters. I got you, girl. I got you. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one of the things that was really astonishing for me when I started traveling was that, you know, I kind of grew up in Michigan and just the idyllic time of kind of place to grow up, very, very Midwest, amazing. And it wasn't really until I actually did my first study abroad in Italy where I did, didn't realize how lucky I was to be in the U.S. that my dad... I don't know if you ever said this, but it was just instilled in me that um, not only can I do something well because I'm a woman, but I can do something better because I am a woman. Mm -hmm. So I was always killing boys in the mile, and, you know, very athletic and mm -hmm. top of my class. And, um, a luckily, real underachiever. I yeah, total, total, <laughs> total nerd. Like when you said in the beginning, I went from a nerd to a socialite. Only in Australia, because my, my accent went really far. When I came back to Michigan, again, total nerd. <laughs> but um, it was... Really nerd like, is cool now. Yeah, right. <laughs> so then when I went to Italy, um, I kind of realized that women are treated like second-class citizens. And um, it's not in an overt way, but just in that way of, you know, some older woman would look down on me if I wasn't wearing a skirt or heels, you know, just wearing trousers or jeans um and just you know the woman kind of role was to be in the kitchen and have babies um and that was really what was it was just very very odd to me and, and you know a lot of harassment as well um from men that I wasn't used to in the U.S. for being a woman so I think that was one of the things that really opened up my eyes where we're so lucky to be in the U.S. and Canada and these other countries where women are we're still not there yet. We still make 70 cents to the dollar, but at least we're getting there because you look at places like India where there's such a major issue of rape going on. Um, and you look at obviously in the Middle East where all these honor killings and Africa where, you know, women are not allowed to go to school if they're menstruating, yeah. you know, and we just realize that and they don't community. have products. They don't have sanitary right. products in many of these places for women. So they literally are using rags. Right. Um, and, you know, you look at a place like in many places in rural India, they don't have, you know, a great way to even clean those racks. So we, we do have a guest coming up who's going to talk about all kinds of international water issues and just how clean, you know, and coming from Michigan, of course, this has got to be a very sensitive topic for you because even in the oh, United please. States, <laughs> water, we have serious water problems, not just in Flint, Michigan but also in many of our uh, large cities, they, there's lead in the water. And of course, Puerto Rico is having a major water crisis, mm -hmm. but so, um, you know, since uh, the hurricane, but of course, even places like Southern California have had epic droughts. 
Oh yeah, I mean, I'm living in it. It's, it was really bad for a while. It's kind of crazy with one storm, it, it kind of went better, but you do learn to be a little bit better about all of that. And, and you know, it's, it's very interesting because when you start getting out of your own, um, we start traveling the world and you start seeing this stuff firsthand, it can get a little bit crazy being in the U.S. with all the media, and we get really um, focused on kind of, not silly things, but we're kind of in the zone of our own things. But then when you start traveling and you realize that there's other issues that people are dealing with, um, like, you know, equality, like being able to just- talk, Like having clean water? Having clean water. You know, you realize that the world is really big and maybe the issues of whatever, you, it just puts everything into perspective a little bit. Right. And I think and that's one of the best things of, of travel. I mean, this, mm -hmm. it's certainly a wonderful learning experience, but if you travel properly, uh, it's a very eye-opening experience and you really see what other cultures are doing and we can learn from that for better or for worse. You know, yeah. we can always learn from good things, but we can also learn from, you know, negative things. And things yeah, I always like say, whenever you travel, you either figure out something about what you're happy about at home or you pick up something new that you want to change from your home. And I think that also, especially when there comes travel bloggers and influencers and experts or whatever, there is kind of this little snootiness of like, oh, well, I've been to this really crazy exotic place that you've never been to. Mm -hmm. Who cares? I don't care if you cruise, mm -hmm. if you do a road trip, or if you're doing some crazy expedition and meditating for five years. To me, they're all the same, and you travel for you, and it's always going to be generally a positive experience. And well, so what I always say about that is... Uh, Traveling is always a really good time or a really good story. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and that's the other part. Like, you don't have to travel so far away mm -hmm. to just get removed from your situation. Sometimes it's a matter of just, you know, I'm here in Beverly Hills, California. If I just go to the Palm Desert or Joshua Tree two hours away, that's enough of a travel just to kind of get you remove yourself. Well, so you I joke with I joke with one of my friends. I live in um, suburban New Jersey. Uh, in a place that's lovingly referred to as horse country. Uh, mm -hmm. We're only 50 miles from New York City, but you know, it's, it's pretty open spaces and lots of farms. And we have a beautiful, beautiful state park that's literally mm -hmm. 10 minutes away. And I hardly ever go there. And I always joke with my friends that if we were in Europe, and we went to this place, we'd be taking tons of pictures and mm -hmm. how amazing this is and how awesome. And we'd be telling all our friends that this is this most amazing place. And it's right in our backyard and we kind of take it for granted. Right. And so I think that's also something too, where you can kind of be a tourist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I love having people visit because it forces me to get out of my daily routine. And that's one thing that I really like to promote is that travel is really accessible. Mm -hmm. And it's just a matter of making those decisions. You know. Um, you know, like my family, my brother and sister, my brother was in a fraternity and my sister was a figure skater mm -hmm. and I chose to use those funds for travel to study abroad. Mm -hmm. So I did, I wasn't part of a frat. I didn't do, I quit figure skating when I was 13. So my major expense was travel and my brother and sister were getting all jealous at me and I'm like, well, you made your decision. And actually your figure skating and your frat bills are more than my one travel. So it's important to just be really, really aware of how much it is to travel and the decisions that you're making. You know, if it, Starbucks is really important to you, that's great. Mm -hmm. But you could also use that money to fund travel. And also, I think one of the big mistakes people use is that they think that you should always travel when you have the time off of work. Mm -hmm. But those are usually the worst times to travel. Like I never travel. And the most like, expensive times to travel. Yeah, like my, you know, my sister and my mom. They went to Arizona over New Year's. Their tickets were eight hundred dollars. Yeah. If they went on the other hand, you have right. a career that allows you tremendous time flexibility. You right, know, but we people, never travel during the people, high season. Right, but most people don't have that kind of work flexibility. Or if they have children, get back to me when you have children. Yeah. So once you have children, you're stuck traveling on winter break, spring break, or summer vacation. Like those are really the only flexible times that you have. Yeah, I mean, well, everyone has two weeks off generally, and Americans are the worst at taking their vacation days. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to take those vacation days. Everyone has them, and you're still getting paid. So there's really if, not well, not ev not everyone. Not everyone. So I understand. Not everybody has two weeks off, <laughs> and certainly not everybody has a job where they have paid vacation. So. 
for starters, everybody who works for themselves. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I work for myself, so I. Uh, second of all, we have unfortunately millions of hourly workers who are not technically full-time employees who don't have any paid work vacation. And these are people who are struggling to, you know, have two or three jobs just to make the ends meet. So I get your point, but I think we have to be aware that, you know, this is not an issue that's accessible for everybody. Um, I think for people who are really struggling to pay the bills, I think your point about, you know, going to what's in your community and what's in your area as though you were a tourist. And I think there, there are certainly incredible resources online uh, for free things to do in your area. So, mm -hmm. you know, certainly like this state park that I, you know, reference that's in my own backyard. Uh, you know, certainly everybody who, you know, has an hour off could go there. Um, and it doesn't cost a plane ticket or, you know, a tremendous travel expense to get there. So I think those are things that we kind of have to bear in mind. Now, when we're talking about the people who do have paid vacation, then well, I'm, is really I'm actually someone that's never really had paid vacation. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm very, I understand that very much how difficult it is to find work. I mean, I'm in one of the most competitive businesses. <laughs> most cutthroat. It's really, really difficult for me to find work. But with that said, I mean, it's all about finding those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, you know, I chose different things when I was in school. I chose to, to do the study abroad. Mm -hmm. um, that's avail available to most people, you know? Well, so it's, again, it's available, but it is very costly. So I just want to bring that in mind. But I mean, for, it's, for example, when I was in college, uh, my family did not have the resources for that. I figured out how to make it happen. I applied for a scholarship loans. to a program. Um, well, and again, with loans, remember, with so many college students already maxed out on their mm -hmm. loans to pay their tuition, you know, that's a real factor. But when I was a college student, I didn't have the financial resources uh, to do that. But I did, I got this great job working for a travel company uh, where I got a commission on every trip to, they were selling trips to Bermuda for spring break. Mm -hmm. And I never would have been able to afford to go to Bermuda for spring break. Um, but I sold these packages and I got a 10% commission. And then as a bonus incentive for every 10 packages that I sold, I got a free trip. So that was kind of my introduction to how to do things kind of in a different or shifty kind of way. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I'm sorry, maybe if I, I made my point the wrong way, but I think that in life, wherever there's a will, mm -hmm. there's a way. Right. So if you really want to travel, you're going to figure out how to adjust things in ways, and I, and I get it, we all go through seasons. Mm -hmm. And some of our seasons don't allow for us to take the trips. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we are you know, smart, and when we have a good season, we get caught up in the little things, and then all that money goes away. And you're just mm -hmm. like, wait, I didn't do anything that I really wanted to do when I had that good season. And so you know, I think it's just it's really important when you are dealing with travel. You don't have to be making a million dollars. Mm -hmm. You can be traveling a lot, and it's just, making sure that's a priority and also figuring out ways to do it. And, and I always say go to Asia because it's so cheap. Although it's and expensive to get there. It's, but it's, it's, it's actually not that expensive to get there. It just takes a while to get there. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I did this trip for 10 days and for vacation chasers on HLN, it was $900 to go to Thailand for 10 days. Wow. And you could, I could rent out my apartment here in LA and actually make money through Airbnb <laughs> if I traveled. I'm not joking. No, I, no, I think money. that's great. I think so that's it's, great. It's thinking outside of the box. And right. I think once you start realizing the world is a really big place, mm -hmm. and if you have a little bit of flexibility about when you can go, then you're really going to get those. And, and, and I'm not like an advocate of taking kids out of school or whatever, but if you fly on Tuesday or Wednesday and you can just have a little bit of that flexibility, mm -hmm you're going to get way more bang for your buck. Right. So and then of course, you know, then you're always travel. you're weighing time versus uh, money. With everything, it's time versus so money. So I actually did take my kids out of school quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> and I got a lot of grief from it, about it from the principal. Um, and so what I started doing is actually tracking all of their educational objectives that were met on these trips. Um, and I traveled for business. 
So, you know, I, whenever I had a great business trip opportunity, I would take them with me. Mm -hmm. One of the organizations that I uh, had an annual meeting with the American College of uh, the American College of, of uh, easy for me to say, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which is why we abbreviated ACOG. <laughs> they had a kids camp program every year mm -hmm. in their meeting where they did all kinds of amazing behind the scenes tours and trips throughout the city, wherever the convention was. And my kids loved that. So mm -hmm. yeah, they got pulled out of school. Yeah, um, I mean, I, but they're I, both I, college I, graduates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like I said, so I, I think it's something where you can always find an opportunity to travel, and it's just a matter of figuring out um, if that's a priority to you. And again, you will find a way to do it if that is a priority to you. Um, well, I, think, I, think, I think your point's that it doesn't have to be far. It right, or, be or it can be super far, but it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be extravagant. Yeah. And I think to kind of get back to our topic, it just has to be safe and healthy. So we have, to, unfortunately, I could talk to you all day, <laughs> absolutely all day, but we have to wrap up. But mm -hmm. I want to ask you just a couple of questions we ask all of our guests. Sure. And I think you're going to have a great answer to this question because you have so much experience with travel. Uh, but what's the most interesting, unique, or memorable experience you've ever had in a ladies' room? <laughs> um, well, there was one where I was in Beijing, China, and um, talk about having a little bit too much to drink. I was luckily with people that I knew and I accidentally locked myself in the door. In, in, but I didn't actually- In the stall. Yeah, and I could have, I just, I wasn't in the right state of mind to figure out how to work the lock. <laughs> and um, my friend ended up uh, kicking a hole through the door and that's how I got through. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so what were so, the consequences? I mean, that's the other thing from a safety standpoint the uh, the legal consequences of misbehavior in some other countries is well, very I mean, I very strict compared i couldn't get through and everyone was like what and so my friend was like ah, da, da. luckily he spoke mandarin he's like she's stuck she's stuck let me kick through and then they ended up figuring it out and it was just one of those where i was like oh wow i, <laughs> I can't believe we did out. that <laughs> but again a good time or a good story yeah, yeah. And there's been a lot of times where I've used the men's room. Uh -huh. And usually, usually men are not cool with it. I'm like, dude, no. come on. No one's using the stall. Let me use the stall. <laughs> yeah. I actually usually have, um, I use the men's room a lot, particularly I go to the theater a lot. That's my big extravagance and thing I love to do. Um, and there's never enough ladies room stalls uh, at the theater, at any theater. I've never, ever, ever seen it. So usually the men are done and then the women start using the men's room. And we usually post one of our boyfriends or husbands at the door and they're supposed right. to go check. So my most interesting experience in a men's room is that my guy guarded the door, but he didn't check first. And three of us walked in and there were several men still doing what they were doing at the urinals. And we just didn't care. We just walked right by, you know, been th we've seen that before, not impressed. Just walked right by, went to the stalls, did what we had to do, and we're back in time for the second act. Yeah. I mean, we've done it so many times, especially on the crew, where just people are, you know, going on the side of the road. And at that point, it's like, you know, nature calls. <laughs> how many, how many, how big is your crew? It's like 12 people. Oh, that's a, that's a lot. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. So Men and women, lots of different bladder sizes. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of men, one of the other questions I like to ask our guests is what's the most important thing you want men to know about healthy travel or every topic that we've discussed today? Because hmm. you know there are lots of men listening because they want to know what we discuss in the ladies' rooms. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm actually one of those women that I'm not someone that's really super into going to the ladies' room with a lot of girls. I'm not like in that wolf pack mentality. Um, but I would say that, you know, I think, I think it all depends on the different kind of men. Like my boyfriend spends more time in the bathroom than I do. He <laughs> takes way longer than I do. So I think that- You, you know, know he's gonna be listening to this, right? Oh, and he totally <laughs> knows, because I yell at him all the time. He's better hair than I do. Like he's, he's the female of the relationship, but I think that's one of those things where, you know, we have all these stereotypical gender roles or roles about how we're supposed to behave, but just be yourself and be cool and, I mean, at some point, you just have to have confidence and you have to be open about yourself, especially when you're traveling. I think, I think that's the, great advice for anywhere, anytime. Yeah. You know, being I mean, cool and being confident. Yeah, when your shame level goes down when you're in a foreign country, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, 
<laughs> that point you just need to get through. All right. So my final question is, uh, what advice, if you had one piece of health advice to give your 21 year old self, what would it be? Mm. Um, oh, well, I know that I struggled a lot with food mm -hmm. when I was in college. I didn't realize that I have a lot of um, major issues with certain foods. So I have a lot of foods that I can't eat, like onions or chickpeas or orange juice or any because sort of Because they juice. upset your stomach or because you have allergies? Or uh, well, I guess I would have allergies, but I just get really stinky. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would be so the we're best. talking gassy. Yeah, so I always, I always travel with gas addicts. Thank I God I had, this, <laughs> I had this one boyfriend who drilled in my head. He said, the prettiest people are the stinkiest people. I don't know if that's true, but whenever I'm stinky, I'm like, it's because I'm pretty. Totally <laughs> not the reason. But I have major issues with food. So it's kind of figuring out um, what you can eat and what you have bad reactions to mm -hmm. and really trying to stay away. And I think one of the things too, I'm actually, I'm going to be doing a YouTube video on this. I actually lost weight on a cruise usually people gain of course it, yeah figuring out certain things to do i also had like a little bit of help with the trainer mm -hmm. um but now i actually lose weight on cruises always well that's great mm -hmm. yeah, i actually did that one time just to see if i could um and i just simply made a rule uh of no bread and that's yeah. all i did was just mm -hmm. no bread and I ate everything else and drank everything else. And then the other thing I did was I did work out every day. Well, yeah, um, just taking the stairs, it's so easy to work, on a, work out on a cruise ship. Yeah, just walking to the, most people, the biggest exercise is walking to the dining room. <laughs> oh yeah, and like walking up those stairs. I mean, I'm in good health and I'm, <gasps> I'm always huffing and puffing. So, but I just, I, now I drop weight and it's, yeah, it's figuring out the right food. And also again, just making it work for you because there's always these meals being prepared. Mm -hmm. so you can ask for whatever you want. It's just right. knowing your body. Well, I think it's also, um, uh, since we're still in January and people are thinking about their New Year's resolutions, I think it's also just being mindful and it's yes. just thinking about it. And even if you make just one rule and you, and you stick to that, it means you have to think about it every time. So when they put the bread basket down on the plate, I actually did say to the waiter, just don't bring that. <laughs> oh yeah, I always tell them, I'm like, just don't even put out, like no croutons, mm -hmm. I'm gonna eat it. And if I tell people no carb, mm -hmm. people are very, very good and, and will help you. They're yeah. very good. Anyway, this has been such a pleasure. I can't wait to see your show. And please come back anytime you have anything new, different, interesting, or exciting to talk to us about in the ladies room. Cool, thank you so much. Thank you, take care. That's all we have time for today. But let's keep the conversation going on Twitter or Facebook at Dr. Dunica. And please join us next week for another episode of In the Ladies Room with Dr. Dunica. Real conversations with real women about really intimate topics.